but uh, it felt guilty, amen? I always heard that if you spook somebody when you walk in the room and they jump, they need to clear their conscience, amen? But uh, let's uh, continue to worship this morning. Once again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. We're praying that God's Spirit will fill this place. And when you leave today, I want you to know that you've been in church, amen? amen. And you've been in His presence. Let's sing just a little talk with Jesus. chance to be able to be in the house of the Lord. I'm going to tell you right here, in the day and age that we live in today, listen to me, where we're at in our country, in our world that we live in today, this is a sincere warning from your pastor. If you've got an opportunity to be in church, you better take it. Amen. You better take it. Because we don't know from day to day what's going to happen in this nation that we live in. Freedoms that you thought that you had secured in this country are gone. Amen. 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 And not only with that being said, but things that are going on, and you'll hear in the sermon today, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that Jesus is preparing to come back for his church. He is coming back for his church. There's going to be lots of Christians. 
They're going to be sitting in these pews while I'm walking through the gates of heaven. I'll give you that answer right now. I'm going to walk through the gates of heaven. When Jesus comes back, I'm going up with that great meeting in the sky. But I'm telling you, this church is going to have members that will still be sitting in these pews. Amen? Amen. If you didn't come to get your toes stepped on this morning. I'm telling you, you chose the wrong church. Amen? Amen. Amen. We come to lift up and to worship the name of Jesus. This next song, we're going to sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And as we sing this song, I want you to worship like Jesus is preparing to come back in the next 5 to 15 minutes. I want you to spend that intimate time with him because a lot of situations that you face in your everyday life can be resolved with a strong walk with him. Amen? Amen. Let's worship together. Open the eyes of my Open the eyes of my heart. Holy, 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 holy,
praise to heaven. I want you to keep worshiping and praising and lifting up his name. It be worthy to be praised. Father, we love you in this place. We come to this building, no other purpose today. To enter this sanctuary. But to worship you. Father, we didn't come here for people. We didn't come here for the pastor. We didn't come here for the choir. We came for you. And Lord, we know that your presence is already in this place. You're here right now, Jesus. And Father, I know there's people in this place this morning. You've got a need that needs to be met. And I want you to know that he's here.
catch you there too, though, isn't it? Why, thank you. You may be seated, and we're going to take this moment in our service to receive tithes and offerings and give you an opportunity to be able to give this morning obediently to the Lord. We want to have an opportunity to give back to Him. It belongs to Him anyway. Amen? You're able to give because He's already freely gave to you. So this morning, as we prepare for an, an opportunity to give, we want you to be obedient to the Lord this morning. There's a, a box that's placed up here in the front of the sanctuary. And during the next song that plays, after we pray for the offering, feel free to come up during that song and to place your tithes and offerings into the, the box that's up here. I'm planning, and this is my goal, is as of next week, we're going to try, and this is a goal that's not set in stone. We've been having some discussion about it. I'm looking at trying to have children's church back in children's church next Sunday. We just have to find a safe way to do that. Uh, with social distancing and stuff to keep your children safe, but um, y'all, there's not enough valium in this pharmacy to be able to let me keep doing this. I'm gonna be honest with you. I love your kids to death, but they're driving me crazy. Amen. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But we'll, uh, we do want to get them next door. I know that they'll have a, a great time uh, to worship over there and to be together. Um, that I know that they like to be rambunctious, and we've got a building for that. Amen. Amen. And uh, so we want them to go over there to be able to do their lessons and eat their snacks. And, and also, I want it more for you as well because that gives you 100% focus on the service. Amen. So as of next Sunday, the plan is, and if anything changes, the only things that may change that is if we had a case of COVID-19 within the church or something like that, which I don't see that in the foreseeable future. But if that does become the case, that would change that decision. Outside of that, next Sunday, we'll plan for children to be back in the children's church. Uh, we'll dismiss this, this is the time during the service where they would be dismissed to go next door. And that way, the sermon portion of the service, you'll have 100% of your focus and your dedication to be towards preparing to receive the message. Amen? Amen. Everybody on board with that? And yeah. by all means, if you don't feel comfortable sending your child to children's church during everything that's going on, I completely, absolutely understand. Amen? Amen. Just bring a hickory switch with you. Amen? Amen. I'm just teasing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you for this opportunity. We ask you to be with us. We ask you to let your presence continue to dwell in this place. Father, I pray in Jesus' precious and mighty name that you'll bless this time of giving. Because, Father, we understand that through your word that giving is also worship. Bless this moment of worship as we give freely and obediently to you. Because, God, you have first freely gave to us. Father, we love you in this place this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your blessing. And we thank you. For spending this intimate time with us in this sanctuary today. God, surely, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Father, we thank you for all that you do. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Pastor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Real quick. Yeah. I'll make this quick. Go ahead. And, you know, Tammy is out today. She, you know, I had to met her a year ago. And she just kind of over did it. And she was barely moving this morning. Uh, a lot of stiffness and everything, but uh, I, you know, we all. She was mentioned in prayer. We all prayed for her, and she's watching online. And she just texted me. She felt that as we were singing and praying, she felt the pain just leave her. Oh, yeah. and I just want to get out of the right there. Absolutely. Quick, quick transitions. That Absolutely. Has to be God. That is awesome. Thank yeah. you for that praise report. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
love and lifted me. I want to do one more, and then I'm going to preach to you for a little bit, if that's okay. I will serve thee. Roger, can you plug that in for me? <coughs> We can sing it together. It ain't me singing, but it's on page 469 in your hymn book. The words aren't on the screen. 469. I believe it'll, we haven't planned this, but I believe it'll play right into the sermon. I told Roger right before that I may go this direction, and it's kind of the way it's working out, so I want to do this together. topic of staying focused, staying focused. One of the things that came up, I even wrote a little blog about it this week on the church's website, was there's so many people talking about wearing masks and having to wear a mask and different cities enacting ordinances and things like that to be able to, to make you wear masks. And there's the, the mainstream media is sharing this message and wanting to know your opinion to where you believe that the president should make it nation, national or nationwide to where everybody must wear a mask. And so there's so much attention coming down to wearing masks and coming down to COVID-19. I've heard COVID-19 for months, and I, I believe wholeheartedly, and I am sincere this morning, I know and believe that it's a real thing affecting folks. 
Do I believe that the mainstream media is showing you what they want you to see? Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. I don't think there's a doubt in anybody's mind or watching online this morning that is any different than that. The media has always been aware of that. And they have always done that. But there's some, some folks, I've even had folks that, that I knew from where we live and things like that who written or, or asked me, say, hey, would you write me a letter saying it's against my religion that I don't have to wear a mask? <laughs> I want to tell you something this morning, and I wrote a blog about this because I, I got chuckled up about it a little bit because I know so, some folks just don't want to wear a mask, some folks don't like wearing seatbelts, and I get that. It's just a part of life. You've got stuff that you don't want to do, you don't like to do, and you don't want to do it. Did y'all know, though, that Moses wore a mask? In the Bible, Moses wore a mask. It's biblical. It's in the Bible. It's biblical. Now, we call it a mask. But if you live in biblical days, back in the Old Testament, if you lived back then, you wouldn't call it a mask. What would you call it? A veil. If you lived back then, you'd call it a veil. There's a scripture in Exodus chapter 34. You turn there if you'd like to, but I want to share it with you, and it's on the screen as well. And I want to tell you a little story about this here in just a moment. I said, now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand. So he had the Ten Commandments. He had the two tablets with him. And he comes down from Mount Sinai. He has those in his hand. Moses did not know that the skin of his face, while he talked with him, with him, Verse 30, so when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Verse 31, then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Verse 32, afterward, all the children of Israel came near and gave, him, gave them as commandments. All that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai, verse 33. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Basically, he put a mask on to cover his mouth. He put a mask on. Yeah. Verse 34, when Moses had went before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the mask. He would take off the veil until he came out. And when he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. Verse 35, And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that his skin, the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him, to speak with the Lord again. Every time Moses went to speak with the Lord, this conversation was so awesome to be in the presence of God. That nobody else realized that at the moment, including Moses, that he had spent this intimate time with God, that his mouth, his face started to glow. Yeah. Amen. And when he came out from spending time in the presence of God, everybody saw this glow coming off of him. And they stood back and they were like, that man's been with God himself. And to get everybody to come a little bit closer because he was so attached to God in this moment. And to keep this situation just a little bit calm it down for everybody else. He said, let me put my mask on real quick. And then they'd come and have a conversation with him. And he'd go back and talk to the Lord and basically recharge his flashlight. And he'd talk to God. He'd take the mask off and he'd talk to God. And when he went to talk to the children of Israel again, he'd put the mask back on so it wouldn't scare everybody about how much he loved the Lord. Amen? Yeah. When I leave this place today, I'm going to want to have to put my mask on to go back out in public. It's not because of coronavirus. It's not because of COVID-19. It's not because anybody's got cooties or any kind of germs or anything like that. It's because I've been in the presence of the Lord. And the light of Him is going to shine so brightly through me. That they're going to take a step back and be like, what's going on? Has He been too close to a nuclear reactor? What is going on with Him? And I'm going to say, no, sir, no, ma'am. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. So when you want a, mask, a, a, a letter from me about not having to wear a mask, I want you to know that wearing a mask is a biblical principle. Yeah. And if you get so close to Jesus and you have this conversation with him, like Moses had this conversation with the Lord, that you might have to put a mask over your mouth. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Do we go through and there's another scripture in the Bible that talks about mask and you have to translate it down several ways and, and to kind of look at this new translation of it. And it's 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 and this is an interesting verse to me. And you talk about Moses and we kind of flip the coin over and it says we refuse to wear a mask and play games. Let's tie that in today. We refuse to wear masks and play games. Because I hear some folks that say, I, there's nothing you can do. I don't care if you write a ticket. I don't care what you have to do. You can call the governor, call the president. I'm not putting a mask on because you told me to. I want you to understand, just like when Moses put a mask on, he had to because of the presence of God that was shining so brightly on him. But on the other side of the coin, I want you to know that sometimes it's not right to put a mask on certain things. Amen? Sometimes you don't need to put a mask over your heart. You don't need to put a mask over the things to be able to show your salvation. The Bible specifically states that you should not hide your salvation. Basically, put a mask over your salvation. Don't put it under this bush or don't put it under this basket. You should let it shine lightly like a lamppost. So there are things that you should not put a mask on. Amen? Amen. When you go through and you look at this and you think about this just a little bit and you kind of dive into the message here and you start thinking about this topic of masks, you start thinking about this, what, what, what does it mean to refuse to wear a mask and to play games? Listen, I think there's a lot of folks, and I'm just going to take this out of context for a moment, I think there's a lot of folks that are playing church. Yep. I think there's a lot of folks that are playing church. You like being here. You like being here because it's normal, it's different, it's, it's unique, it's, it's what you've done, what you've always done. I think there's folks that watch service every single Sunday, and it's just the normal part of life. It's like watching Jeopardy every afternoon. You like doing it because you've always done it, your grandma's always done it, her grandma's always done it. It's just a part of life. What I want you to understand is that there's no time to play games. That sometime in the near future, I believe it's going to be probably within my lifetime, I believe, my personal opinion, I believe, that Jesus will come back for his children. Amen. The way that the world is going today, I believe sooner than later, Jesus is preparing actively right now to come back from the church. And when he comes back from the church, I want you to know that there will be people. There will be. There's no doubt about it. It is a solid fact. There will be people in the scripture that proves it. That there will be people that will still be occupying the pews of this church because you played church and you didn't go to church. You cannot play church. Amen. Psalms 116 and 12 says, What shall I, what shall I render to the Lord? What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits? Towards me. What shall I render to the Lord? What are you giving to Him? What are you doing for Him? Amen. How are you worshiping Him? How are you serving Him? What will I? I want you to ask yourself that question right at the margin of your note section. What am I rendering to the Lord for all of His benefits towards me? God has been good to you. There's no doubt about it. There's not a person in this place today that can argue with me. And if you want to, after the service, we go to my office and you can argue to your blue in the face. And I'll prove to you how God's been good to you. Amen. I'll win that argument every single time. I promise you. I've been married. I'm a professional arguer. I can do it. Amen. God has been good to you. Bible also tells us in Romans 12 and 18, if it is at all possible, as far as it depends on you, you are to live at peace with everyone. Yeah. If it's possible, I love how that says that. Thank you, Jesus, for putting that in there. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. We go a little bit further in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells us this. And this I say to you for your own profit. Not that I may put a lease on you. But what is proper that you may serve the Lord without distraction. I don't know if that one's on there or not. Serve the Lord without distraction. 
So when we talk about staying focused this morning, I want you to understand there's a lot of things that can cause you to lose focus, to easily become distracted, and take your attention off of Him. And if you lose your focus on Him, you risk the risk of being one who gets left behind. You have to keep your attention on Him. Keep your attention on on him. Second Timothy chapter 3 gives us this understanding. A lot of these aren't on the screen this morning. I'm going to give you lots of scripture. In the last days, perilous times will come. We also know that evil men and seducers will grow wax worse and worse and worse. But Joel also said that in the last day that God said this. He said, I will pour out my spirit. So we've got this understanding that in this time of peril that we're living in today. This time of peril that we're living in is also in simultaneous movement. This is also a time where God has specifically stated that in these last times, these perilous times, that he will also be pouring out his spirit. What are you going to focus on? Are you focused on the perils of time or are you focused and looking towards him so he can pour out his spirit on you? What are you focusing on this morning? So I want you, want you to put your attention on today in the midst of this sermon. When God's going to do something great in your life, when God's going to do something incredible in your life, there's always some situation, some obstacle that comes up and it's going to try and distract you from what you need to focus on. There's always going to be something that comes up. I say it all the time. All the time. When God's a blessing, the devil's a messing. Amen. When God's a blessing, the devil is a messing. And you need to be able to stay focused on him. We have heard of this story and we read it all the time. I'm not going to read it to you in great detail this morning. Just kind of recap it, the story of Peter. And he's facing this storm. And the situation that's going on, and we know even in our lives that God wants to do something incredible. In his life, God wanted to do something incredible. And when you face a certain storm that's surrounding you, just like with Peter, you can't lose your focus. It can be devastating. You cannot lose your focus because it can be devastating. Peter was in the situation where Jesus had told him, come on, and we're going to take these steps. And in the midst of this particular situation, there was a storm that surrounded him in the midst of what Jesus was trying to do. And when this happens, even in our lives, sometimes you hear the thunder. Sometimes you see the flash of the lightning. Ashley and I were driving down 557 just the other day. We were leaving Lake Wiley, headed towards Clover on 557. You guys know where that's at. As we were driving down the road, there's certain spots on that road to where you can kind of see the skyline. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's almost like being kind of up on a mountain a little bit. You can see a lot of the, the greener. The clouds were just spot here and there. It was blue skies, these pretty white clouds, and the sun was shining. It was hot. Golly, it was hot. But then when we got a little bit closer to town, we started looking up in the sky. There was the beauty of the sky, but then just over to us, it looked like a couple of feet. There were pure black clouds, and it was just shooting lightning bolts all over the sky. And then my phone popped up, and a little, little weather alert popped up on this little free app that I got, and it says severe lightning near your location. And I said, well, that's just crazy because it's beautiful right here. And she was like, look right there. And it doesn't like it was directly coming towards us, but there was a storm in the midst of everything being beautiful that was starting to surround us. And as it started to surround us, things became gloom. I noticed with every crack of thunder and every bolt of lightning that it drew my attention. And Ashley was sitting over in the pasture seat and I was driving. And as the lightning flashed, I would look up and it grabbed my attention. Just a few minutes later than that, then here comes all the leaves blowing and, and the wind came out of absolutely nowhere. And it was, the wind was blowing like crazy. The, the trees like they were bending over. And I was like, there, there's nothing on the radar. 
There was absolutely nothing on the radar whatsoever. And as I looked on the radar and I checked it again, there was still nothing on the radar. But there was this thunderstorm. There was this lightning. There was everything that was happening in the midst of this situation. And I thought about Peter. He's going out there. And if you go back and you read the story, what distracted him was one thing. And it wasn't the devil. It wasn't no demon. It wasn't nothing else. It was one simple thing. It was the wind. It was the wind. The Bible specifically states that he was distracted by the wind. The simplest, natural thing that you could possibly be thinking of. And, and I was the scripture writer and, and God had given me that. I'm like, we're going to have to put something a little bit more, you know, a little bit more impressive in here if we want to capture the, the attention of the audience. And, and God said, no, 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 it's, this is a story to this. There's a story to this. And he said the one thing that, it, that got his attention, the one thing that grabbed his attention was the wind. And oftentimes in our life, what I want you to see right here, right now, is oftentimes in our lives, we see a, a bright flash. And that lightning in your life might be fear. It might be anxiety. It might be discouragement. Then also there may be thunder clouds. There's thunder claps. These big old booms. And that's just negativity coming into your life. That's just doubt coming into your life. There's a lot of things that can distract us. And they can be simple, natural things in our everyday life that grasp our attention. But I want to encourage you this morning that you have to do one thing. And that one thing is you have to stay focused. You have to stay focused. Don't focus on the storm. Don't focus on the sea. Don't focus on anything else. What I want you to focus on is Jesus and Jesus alone. Focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. God is working his plan and working his will and, and God's got something in store for you. Jeremiah tells us and he reassures us that God has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. He's got something in store for us. And this is something good that God is working on. There's no doubt in my mind that every person that is represented in the sanctuary and watches this sermon online, that God has got something in store for you. But what are you being distracted by? God has got something good in store for this church. But what are we distracted by? Is it the simplest, naturalest things in life? Or is it something great and mighty that the devil wants to try to push our way? But sometimes it might just be us. It might not be all on him. It might just be us from time to time that these distractions come in. As we go through and we look at this just a little bit further, I think that the enemy's job, his number one priority, is to find a way to keep our eyes off of Jesus and to use a distraction, to use a distraction to stop us from doing what God has sent us on a mission to do, a purpose to do, what he's called us to do. You see, this distraction, as we said, when Peter wasn't demons and devils or anything like that. This distraction was something as simple as the wind, a natural thing. There's a place that Ashley and I want to go, and I've been telling Ashley, and she showed it to me, and we've been talking back and forth about it over the last few days and talked to a friend of ours about it. There's a place that I want to go. You may have seen it or heard of it or know about it. You may have been the first time you ever hear about it. There's a place called Fort Jefferson. Fort Jefferson, and when you go and you think about it, it's in the dry Tatugas. This is a picture of it. This is off Key West. You have to take a boat or a seaplane to get there. You can't drive there. If you take a boat from Key West, it is two and a half hour boat ride to be able to get there. This is a national park. Fort Jefferson, it's called the Dry Tortugas. If you want to look it up, I want you to look it up, Google it, find a YouTube video. It is absolutely breathtaking. It's a national park, it costs 15 bucks to get in. But it is absolutely amazing. They've got these moats all the way around it. You can camp here. You can go here on vacation. You know what I love so much about the dry tortugas? There is no mosquitoes because you're so far away from the land. 
They're surrounded by seven islands. They, it's a bird watcher's paradise. They say around when the seasons are changing, you can go there and there are thousands and thousands of birds that you can see flying over these other islands because they're traveling. They're migrating. The water is crystal clear. You can go scuba diving, snorkeling. There's coral reef all around it. They've got everything set up and ready to go. It's one of the, I believe wholeheartedly, it's one of the most beautiful national parks that this country has to offer. Look it up and drive toward two things. But when we were talking about this, I told Ashley, I said, I really, really, really want to go here. And I want to see it. You know another thing that's amazing about the drive toward two is? There is absolutely no cell service there. There is no cell service. No distractions. Amen. No distractions. So when you go and you think about the drive to Tugas, I told Ashley, I said, I want to go there. But the reason I want to go there is because there will be no distractions. But the deal I made with her was that I don't want to go during hurricane season. <laughs> Two and a half hour boat ride out to this island. And the only way you can get there is by boat or seaplane. I think it's about a 45 minute seaplane ride with about a two and a half hour boat ride. Drive for two days. See, hurricane season is unique because the wind is so strong sometimes. Y'all remember just a couple years ago, just right up the road from the church, we had these tornadoes that popped up out of the middle of nowhere, it seemed like. Devastated several families. Took some of their loved ones, went on to be with the Lord, but also destroyed houses and, and personal property and belonging. And you know what destroyed all of that? The wind. Something simple as the wind destroyed all of that. And I know in life that we have natural things that pop up that distract us. You know, with Peter, it was the wind. But I think with us as church people, I call us church folks. As, as with church folks, I think a lot of what distracts us is also little simple things. It might not be the wind. But I think it's paying bills. I think it's having to work. Having to work overtime. I think it's things like having to run errands. And you've got to go do this and you've got to do that. And you just got a lot of stuff in life that makes life busy and it's busyness. Your job may keep you busy from time to time. Running from place to place with your, your children or running errands for your children and grandchildren and things like that. Maybe it's something as simple as, as a flat tire on the car. Daryl and them had their bus out here yesterday and they were getting ready to leave here. And I think it was somewhere up near Lenore they were singing this morning. They pulled up and everything was good and they'd already got word that the Isaiah 61, two of the members of their, their group had, had a, test, a positive test for COVID-19. Well, then also after they pulled up here and they get ready to set up all the equipment and everything, they started up the generator on the bus. It didn't work. Generator was running, but it wasn't producing power to the rest of the bus. There was no air conditioning and things like that. But it wasn't a big deal for here, but it was a significant deal when you've got a ride in this thing with no windows that are open up and stuff like that, no airflow, and you've got to be stuck in that thing for a couple hours with a bunch of guys. And so I realized that it was something simple as a generator that was causing them to be distracted. It was something that's like with us, if we had a flat tire on our car, sometimes that could cause us to be distracted. You've got your, your mind made up, you're ready to go somewhere, but then a distraction comes up. It makes you lose focus. Sometimes when we lose focus, I want you to understand this morning is when you lose focus, you're taking your eyes off him. That affects you spiritually. That affects you spiritually. There's a story I absolutely love in Luke chapter 14, and it talks about the master's table. This particular story is fascinating. It says, now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard the, these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. This particular story in, in, in Luke chapter 14 talks about how folks can become distracted from what's really important. 
It's an amazing story. And the, the Bible tells about how a master prepared a great meal. And he, he called and sent out invitations and, and asked and invited some folks to come and to dine with him for everything is now ready. And the scripture said that there was a man who said he bought a piece of real estate. And he says, I can't make it. Listen to this, verse 16. And he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. Verse 17 said, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. Listen. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. They began to make excuses. Let's look at the next part of that. The first one said when the invitation went out, I bought a piece of ground, some real estate, but I've got to go and look at it. I can't make it to supper at the master's table because I bought this piece of land and I need to go and look at it. I ask you to have me excused. And verse 19 says, and the other one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm not, I'm going to test them out. I asked you to also have me excused. Verse 20 says, still, another one said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. All of these excuses, all of these excuses. One says he had business to do. He, he bought this real estate, and he had to go and see that. The other one said, I got five yoke of oxen. I need to go and, and work with them. I need to train them just a little bit. I need to go and test them out. And the other one says, I, I've got me a wife. I got married. I'm sorry, but I'd love to come, but I'm dedicated to this relationship. I'm distracted from what's important. You see, it wasn't Satan that was at work here. It wasn't demons or hell that was at work here. It was business. It was busyness. And it was materialistic things in life. I think that we as a church become too busy in things that we like to do. It was a relationship right here. Verse 20. A relationship that was allowed to take priority over a relationship. If you want your marriage to be the best marriage that you've ever had in your entire life, the one that could be the best marriage in the entire world, if you want that, your marriage needs to come after him. Yeah. Amen. Anything that you put before him, he cannot be in charge of. But if you allow him to be first and let him cover that marriage, that marriage would be blessed like never before. You see, it was business and busyness and relationship that were all allowed to come before that. The, the favorite part of that entire scripture is it said that they all, with one accord, started making excuses. We can't be coming in this relationship that we're in right now. We cannot allow ourselves to start making excuses. I believe that God is watching wholeheartedly the people right now. I believe the world is watching the people right now. And if in this time and age that we live in today, we as a church start making excuses. Not only is what the church is going to do about this pandemic. Let's see what the, the world the, the world is watching us. The world is looking at us and the, the world is saying let's see what the church is going to do about this situation. What's the church going to do about that situation? We cannot sit back and be quiet and keep our mouths shut while the world is there was busyness relationships Are keeping us from the things that God wants us to do. God's plan for us. I want you to stay focused and don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. I am determined. I am determined to know nothing among you. I refuse to be distracted. 
Basically, I refuse to be distracted. He doesn't want to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. The story of the cross, that's what we're living by. The story of the cross, the message of the cross. I don't want to become distracted. I think that people are in your life and there are people in your life that you're surrounded by that will try and distract you themselves and to keep you away from the purpose, the destiny that God has set out for you. Not only is it natural things that we have to worry about, like busyness, but also when you think in the account of this marriage, I think there are people in your life that will distract you. This is found in the story of David and Goliath. This is another familiar story. We won't go through it in great detail, but I want to tell you about this. David had an account where he was going to face Goliath and take down the giant. You all know the story. You learned it a long, long time ago. But before this situation took place, David asked what the reward was for killing the giant. Go back and read it. He said, what is the reward for killing this giant? He didn't want to just run out and fight him just because the giant was running his mouth. Just because the giant was saying negative things. Just because the giant was stirring up some dust. David didn't like what he was saying. But he understood that he needed to know if this was a fight worth jumping into. I think that sometimes there are going to be people around you that are going to try to provoke you. They're going to try to stir the dust up, the sand up around you. But I think the enemy sometimes will use those folks to do those things. And you just need to push that aside and be like David and say, is this worth getting involved in? Is this worth getting involved in? David, David didn't want to get into a, a battle, a fight. That had no significant outcome, no reward for where God was wanting to lead him in the future. What his plan was, God had this plan in place. And David didn't want to get involved in something that wasn't a part of God's plan, God's will. They told him when he asked the question of what was the reward for this, that whoever killed the giant would be able to get the king's daughter as his wife. And their family from that point on would be exempt from paying taxes. With that one victory, David's whole family line would change. They would go from a low-income family of shepherds straight to royalty. They would be in the king's family. David thought that this is, this is a battle worth being involved in. This is a part of the plan that God has in place. This is something that I should spend my time in. This is Today, we all fight too many battles. They are not significant. We lose focus and we get distracted by little things that are not worth your attention. Listen to me. You get distracted, you lose focus about things that are not worth your attention. Before David faced Goliath in this particular story, his father, go back and read the story, he asked him to do one thing that I thought was absolutely funny and I loved the way that it... ...in another city on a battlefield. And so when David went down to take this lunch, David arrived and he gave the lunch to his oldest brother and his oldest brother was really, really jealous of David. And he said in front of everybody, what are you doing here, David? What are you doing here? What did you do with those few sheep, those couple sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? He was belittling him in front of everybody. He didn't thank him for traveling several days just to bring them a ham sandwich. Just to bring them some lettuce, some cheese, just to bring them some lunch. He didn't give him any thanks for that. He belittled him in front of everybody. He insulted him. Now, David, we know in the story, had already killed a bear and a lion by his own hands. Y'all remember that part? He killed him by his own hands. So he might have been young, but he wasn't a shrimp. He wasn't. A weakling. 
He was able to handle himself. He was able to do what he needed to do. And, and David thought about this. There's no doubt about it in my mind that if David had to, he could have handled his older brother. But David sat back and he thought about it. What, what benefit is it to me if I jump in and I beat up my older brother right now? But you know what the scripture says took place? That if you go back and read it, the Bible says that he actually turned and walked away. David ignored him. And I think that what we have to learn to do is we've got to learn who to ignore. We've got to learn who to ignore because sometimes they are keeping you distracted. You are losing focus. You need to ignore them. You've heard the old saying before, if you stop feeding a stray cat, they won't come around. Amen. Quit feeding it. Let it start. Paul said in Romans 12 and 18, as far as you can, live at peace with everybody. It doesn't say that it's always going to have peace with everybody. That You're not always going to have peace with everybody. There are going to be people in your life that do not want to have peace for you. They're not going to want to have peace. They didn't want peace. He was jealous. He just wanted to stir the pot. I see people post it all the time, and I love sharing it. If you stir the pot, you should be made to lick the spoon. Amen? Amen. You stir the pot, you should be able to lick the spoon. David had to accept that his brothers were not going to be at peace with him. And what did David do? David, in the scripture, said he ignored it, he walked away, and he left it behind. Don't let the fear of what people think affect you. You know, when you think about people, what they think and their opinion of you and, and things like this, I felt that way in my life. I, I'd always worried about what other people had thought and I always worried about church members and, and offending people. And I was like, you know what, I want to, I want everybody to be happy and loving. And when I first became a pastor, I said, you know what, this is going to be the best thing that has ever happened in my life. Everybody's going to be so happy. Everybody's going to love one another. It's going to be great. We're going to worship Jesus. And you know what? Sometimes it is a lot of those things. We do always worship Jesus. But we always don't do it in one accord. Sometimes we just don't like each other. And then you have to understand this. Sometimes it's okay not to like each other. Just because you don't agree, don't mean you can't be friends. And I think that's a lot of the relationship that we have to learn in this world today. Sometimes you're just not going to agree. And it's okay not to disagree. People today, if you disagree, they're going to unfriend you from Facebook. Yes. They will. It's because you have a different opinion of them. You know what? Opinions are like armpits. Everybody got them, they all stink. There's a story, and we understand in the Bible, and I'm going to get you out of here in just a few minutes, probably sometime before 2 o'clock. When you think about a fear of what other people are thinking, when you think about what other people are thinking, you're so worried about depressing someone or offending them or, or worried about hurting. But you know what? This particular story, this is one of the main reasons that Saul lost his throne. Because he was worried about what everybody else thought. God told him to take care of certain things and he did them halfway. He came and he confronted him and Saul admitted to him, I disobeyed the Lord's instructions. And he says, because I was afraid of the people. So I did what the people asked me to do. Instead of doing what God asked him to do, he was afraid of what the people would think. So he did what the people asked him to do. God had a, a great plan in store for Saul. He was going to take him to amazing places, but, but Saul didn't want to disappoint people. He didn't want to hurt people's feelings. He didn't want to offend them. Basically, he didn't want to rock the boat. And because of that, he had to pay the consequences of that. See, you can't be a people pleaser all the time. You have to understand that sometimes to stay on track with where God is leading you in God's plan, there are going to be people that are going to have to be cut to the side. Amen. This happened with Abraham and Lot. 
You know the story of Abraham and Lot? God didn't speak to Abraham until Lot was out of the picture. This is family. Read it. As soon as Lot was pushed and moved to another land, God began to speak to Abraham. Silence, therefore, before that. I want you to go through and look at the stories that I'm trying to share with you this morning. You may have to disappoint a few people. You may have to trim the fat. You may have to trim the vine. You may have to push some folks to the side to be able to stay on track with where God is leading you. You're not going to be able to please everyone all of the time. Amen? Amen. I had a problem with telling people no for the longest time and still do for some of the part of today. But I've done a lot better at it. I used to hate saying no because I'm going to say no. They're going to get mad. and They get mad. They're going to leave the church. But you know what? I have to say no sometimes. If every single one of you called and asked me to do something today, do you think wholeheartedly that I can honestly, in time management, do it all at the same time? There's no way whatsoever. I would drive myself crazy, and I did that for years. I drove myself crazy. I got And I was just going absolutely nuts. I did not know how to manage it because I didn't want to tell nobody no. I had to learn that sometimes it's okay to say no. Yes. Because that was a part of the thing. I had to stay focused. I had to stay focused. Yes. There's a story in Esther. I'm going to close you out with this. There's a story in Esther. Esther chapter 3. And the Bible talks about Haman. And how he was, the Bible says, a mighty, mighty man. He was riding through the kingdom. He was second only to the king of Persia. And he was riding through the city and everybody in the kingdom. The Bible said they bowed and cried out, thou art a mighty man. Except for one person. <laughs> and that one person was Mordecai. Everybody in the entire city, when Haman rode through, kneeled and bowed and cried out, Thou art a mighty man, except for Mordecai. This is significant. Mordecai refused to bow. He lost focus and was distracted. By the one that did not bow. And in this story, if you go back and read it, he went back and he was going to make a plan. And he proposed it to the king to where he was going to execute all the Jewish people. Just completely wipe out the entire race. Just get rid of it all together. All the Jewish folks that were going to be executed. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to get to that The king approved it. But that night, the king tossed and turned, the scripture says. He, he could not sleep. He was restless. He, he couldn't focus. Why, why couldn't Haman just write off that one person? Why couldn't he just forget about it? Why couldn't he just move on? Everybody else in the city was in one accord. Why was this one person such a bother? And I believe that, that some of us are a lot like Haman in a way. We've got all these great things going for us in life. But there's one person that's becoming an issue. There's one problem, one situation that's becoming an issue. So we've got everything else for us is going well. But we've got one problem. And that one problem is what's keeping us up at night. It's that one problem is causing us to stress. It's that one problem that's causing us to toss and turn. It's that one problem that's giving us a fix. You see, the king tossed and turned. He wasn't sleeping. And, and so he had asked for a service to come in and, and to give an account of everything that was going on. He said, go on and get me up to speed on everything that's happening in the kingdom. I want to know everything that is, that is going on. And they were going through and they were reading these things. And as they were reading them, they started reading and he heard something that he had never heard before. I want you to read this story. He went back and he heard something he had never heard before. They started talking about Mordecai 
and how he stopped a terrorist attack, this plot that was going to try and assassinate the king. He came and he warned them, and they caught the assassins, all because of what Mordecai did. The king said, why, why have I never heard this story before? What did we do for this man? How did we honor him? How did, how did we go out and, and do anything great for him? How did we repay him and thank him for all of this? He said, my goodness, this, this man here, he saved my life. They, they didn't put two together yet. How did we do this? Who is Mordecai? I don't know who he is, it says, but... This is the words. He is a man who I want to delight, who I want to honor, and I want to honor him in a big way. You see, this story made a drastic, drastic, drastic turn. The king looks out, and there's Haman out there, and he calls Haman over, and he asks Haman, he starts to talk to him. And he says, you know, he brings him into his presence and the king says to Haman, he goes, what would you do if the king had somebody that he was thinking about that he wanted to honor and delight himself? And what would you do? Haman thought he was about to get a job promotion. He thought something good was about, he thought that he was talking about him. And the king asked Haman, what would you do if it was you? What would you do? And he says, oh man, let me tell you, Haman thinks he's in the situation where he's talking. He goes, I, I would really like to, to bless him. Here's what I'd do for him. I'd put the king's royal attire on him. I'd get the king's clothes and put it on him. I'd get the king's horse and let him ride through the streets. I'd put a crown on his head. And I would get somebody to run before him and say, Behold a man whom the king delights. And the king said, that's a great idea. Let's do that for Mordecai. The one that didn't bow. You see, sometimes you'll let the wrong thing take your focus off of the right thing. Today, as we close this sermon out, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to stay focused. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus is coming back for his children. Be like David. Don't let the little stuff bother you. You need to learn to brush that off your shoulders. You're stronger than that as a Christian. You're going to face trials. You're going to face these obstacles in life. The Bible says it. Being a Christian is not a walk in the park. You're going to face this controversy in your life. It's how you deal with it. That makes the, the difference in the end. It's how you deal with it. Can you handle it? If you can't handle it, God's not going to give you more. Amen. You want to be blessed? Act like you can handle the little stuff. When you can handle the little stuff, God's going to say, I can trust them with more. I can trust them with more. If I had little Lila back there and I said, you know what? I want to bless her. I'm going to give you $1,000 because I love you. What do you think is going to happen to that $1,000? She's going to lose it. She's going to misplace it. She's probably going to color on it, take scissors to it. <laughs> Something's going to happen. She's not going to go and invest it and do something great with it. She's not going to spend it on what? She's not going to buy diapers and, and, and bottles and stuff like that. She's going to waste it. But if I give her a quarter, give her a nickel, give her a dollar, and I can see that she goes and she puts it in her little piggy bank and she starts taking care of it. And I said, well, I can give her $5 because she knows what to do with it. I can trust her with it. You see, God's doing the same thing with you. If, if you were sitting here with someone and, and you just not getting along today, God said, I can't give them what they're praying for because they can't even handle that conflict. I, I can't bless them with this because they can't handle that. You say that you want to be the manager at the Walmart. Well, you can't even handle the disagreement that you're having with the person in your family. You can't even handle the disagreement.
I'm going to tell you this. The blessings of God to overshadow you in your life. Because if you get distracted, you become distracted, it will rob you of your blessing. Satan can't take your blessing from you. The devil can't take your blessing. The demons can't take your blessing. You can lose your blessing by losing focus. Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet as we pray today. Lord, we love you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you in this place today. God, I pray that you would take and bless us and use us. Father, multiply us. God, I pray that you would do some great and mighty things through the kingdom of heaven within your people. God, we love you so much for all that you do for us. Father, I pray that you'll bless us today as we leave this place. Bring us back to the next appointed time. Let us always remember that we come to this place for no other purpose but to lift up and glorify your name. It is in the precious and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let us all say, Amen. 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 God bless you. I love you. Y'all go in peace, and we'll see you next time we get together. Thank you.